So uh, before we get started into our scripture, I want to share a little story with you. When I was a senior in high school, I got my driver's license. Now, I was a little late to the party, and I can remember being so embarrassed because my friends had all gotten their driver's license by the time they were sophomores in high school, and I remember just that frustration and embarrassment of having to call them up and be like, hey, we're supposed to be going to hang out. Can you give me a ride? And they would regrettably say yes every single time. But no more. I was a boy with a newfound freedom and access to my mother's car. And with this newfound freedom came very little responsibility. And so I knew, though, I knew I needed to be careful because my mother's car, very expensive, and I lived off a lavish zero dollars a year salary. So there was no shot that I was making repairs to this car. So I knew, okay, at the very least, I've got to be somewhat careful when I drive it. And things went really well for about one month until I was driving to a buddy's house. Now, I want to remind you, I grew up in Mississippi and my buddy lived kind of out in the country. And so there's not a lot of street lights out here. And when it's four o'clock in the afternoon, that's perfectly fine. But after going to his house, we watched a movie that night, and I was coming back home. And as I left his house, it was pitch black outside. And not only was it pitch black, but there was this thick, heavy fog that had settled over the road. But, but no worries, because I was a pro driver with a whopping one month of experience. So I knew how to handle this. And so I'm driving down the road, and of course, literally like 30 seconds into driving, the windshield fogs up. So I do what I'm supposed to do, and I reach all the way down. And I turn the defrost on, and I come back up. And as the fog clears away from the windshield, I realize that I'm heading straight for a mailbox at 40 miles an hour. And so instinctively, I swerve trying to miss it, and it wasn't enough. I ended up clipping the mailbox with the corner of the frame and windshield of my mother's car, and I hit it so hard that I actually broke the wind seal on the windshield, so when I drove home, it whistled. And I can remember in this moment, panic instantly set in, right? I'm breathing so heavily. I don't even remember driving down the road. I just remember that about a mile, a mile and a half into the drive, there was this little country church off on the side, and they had a parking lot. And so I pulled in really quickly, and I parked, and I decided I've got to get my wits about me. I mean, I had just done the one thing I wasn't supposed to do, damage my mother's car. I mean, how would she react? So in that moment, I start planning my funeral. I'm thinking through what my eulogy is going to be. And in that moment, my brain kicks in and goes, no, 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 there's a better idea. Lie. Because that always works. And so I call my mom with no plan as to what this lie is going to be, by the way. And as she answers, my brain shuts off, and the only four words I can get out are, mom, I hit a crow. A crow! Who hits a crow? I mean, I couldn't think of like maybe a deer or like a tree branch falling from a tree. No, a crow. And so I try to backtrack and say, no, it, was, it had to have been something bigger. Like, I don't know, maybe it was a brick or something. But damage was done. A crow it was. And this may come as a shock to you, but my mother did not believe me. I know, the audacity. But I managed to keep up my lie for two weeks. Mm-hmm, impressive. Until... We went to my grandparents' house. My grandfather took one look at the car and thought that that dent was oddly mailbox-shaped. And at that moment, I thought, okay, I'm warming up to the idea of coming, uh, coming clean here because I like my life and I would like to live past the ripe old age of 17. So I ended up telling my mother the truth, and everything's perfectly fine now. Um, but here's the deal, right? We all have done things that we regret. Every single one of us have moments in our life We've made mistakes, some big, some small. And maybe you look back at those moments in your life, those mistakes, and you laugh at them, like I do with my teenage driving, because there's tons of stories. But maybe for some of you, those mistakes aren't that funny. Maybe for some of you, the mistakes in your life are painful. That sin has left your life a mess or your marriage in shambles, or your relationships with people a wreck, and you feel like you're at rock bottom and you don't know where to go. Well, I just want to say as we get started today that if that's you, 
If you feel that way, I want you to know that no matter what you've done, there's hope. That no matter how bad you think you've messed up, no matter the sin, that we can find freedom and forgiveness in Jesus because your sin is no match for your Savior. And so that's the truth that we're going to talk about today. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can go ahead and open those up to Romans 8 for me. We're going to start there and we'll kind of bounce around just a little bit. And we're continuing our sermon series, Mind Games. So if you haven't been here for the past couple of weeks, what we've been doing is we've been talking about some different ways that our thoughts affect our well-being and also can help to strengthen our relationship with God. And so today, we're going to take a look at what Paul has to say about sin, and more specifically, our response to sin and the aftermath to it in light of what Jesus has done for us. So, uh, you've got your Bibles, we're going to look at Romans 8.1 to start out today. And it says this, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We'll stop there. So right off the bat, Paul starts off this chapter with an incredible and really awesome reminder that if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, then there's no condemnation found in Jesus, which is awesome, right? That's forgiveness of sin. It means the punishment's taken care of, and that's great news. But here's the deal. Paul wasn't writing to people who didn't know who Jesus was. Paul's writing to a church. These are Christians, So these are people that should at least have some idea of what God's grace is. So why write this now? Well, there's this word at the beginning of the verse. It's therefore. And therefore lets us know that as Paul begins what we call chapter 8, it's really a continued thought from what Paul had been talking about before. And so in order for us to understand why Paul is talking about not finding condemnation in Christ, we need to back up and look at what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. So that's what we're going to do first. We're going to look at verses 14 through 20, and then we'll talk about it. It says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate to do, or what I hate, I do. And if I do not do what I want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who does it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it is no longer I who does it, but sin living in me that does it. So Paul uses this chapter, Romans 7, to flesh out this idea of the law and our relationship with the law. Now, I want to remind you the law is found in the Old Testament. It was what God gave his people as kind of a way, a standard to live. And so Paul starts off this chapter by saying, look, the law, you need to understand, it's spiritual. And so the law in and of itself is not bad. You need to remind yourself that the law, it's God-given. It's perfect. But the issue is, is that that perfect law was given to a messed up mankind. And so Paul talks about his relationship with the law here in verses 14 through 20. And so you see this kind of back and forth in place with Paul. And so he says, look, I know what I'm supposed to do. And I know what I'm not supposed to do. But the problem is I keep doing what I'm not supposed to do. And I don't do the good things. And so he says in response to this, he says, look, it's not that I do these things. But it's the sin in me that does them. And this is not Paul making an excuse for his actions, but it's really Paul trying to understand his nature. And so this is what Paul calls his sin nature. And this is a really important concept for us to understand today. Now, when I was a freshman in high school, I had a football coach by the name of Coach Broom. And he was a really old school guy. He had two sons who were in the Marines, and he's the kind of football coach whose answer to every problem for a football player was just some kind of exercise-related punishment, so we loved him. But this dude spent a lot of time with 14-year-old boys, okay? And so he had this phrase that he would say to us all the time because I can't even imagine some of the things we must have said to him. And every time he would reply the same way, every time we did something dumb, he would shake his head, And he'd sigh and he'd just go, you're just a sick individual. (laughs) And that never offended us because we knew the reality was, yeah, that's probably true. (laughs) But here's the deal. Paul 
He's not unique in his sin struggles. The reality is, is that every single one of us, just like my old coach used to say, we're, we're sick individuals. We struggle with this concept of sin, and we struggle with being able to do good, and so this is what we call our sin nature. It's human nature. And so Paul, when he talks about sin nature, he uses a Greek word called sarkonos. Can you put it up? There we go. Thank you. Sarkonos. And sarkonos means of the flesh. And so this word is a really particular choice for Paul. Because typically when you talk about sinfulness and sin, there's a variation of this word called sarkikos. It's very similar, but it's a different meaning. It means carnal and sinful. But Paul is really specific and deliberate in his use of sarkonos here. Because he wants us to understand that when he talks about the idea of sin and a sin nature, that it's not just an attribute. It's not just something we do, but it's who we are. And so as you look at this and you understand this, it highlights the very real reality for us that you're going to mess up. You are going to make mistakes. And so you don't really need to be shocked by the fact that you sin. In fact, if we're being honest with ourselves, there's a really, really, really good chance that every single person in this room sinned just this morning, whether it was conscious or unconscious. But that's who we are. Romans 3.20 says it this way. It says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And so when we look at the law, we should understand this idea that we are inherently bad. It's just who we are. And so the problem with this is, is that if you're a Christian, this is in direct conflict with your spiritual life, your spiritual nature found in Jesus. And so think about Paul for a second. I just want to paint you a picture. If you don't know Paul's life, I want to remind you about him, that he was a stringent rule follower, right? He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's the guy who believed it was holy law of God to kill Christians to protect the Old Testament covenant. But on the road to Damascus, he's going to have an encounter with God. And then not only that, a couple of days later, he's going to give his life to Christ. And then right after that, Paul's going to start to become a missionary. And he's going to end up becoming the most impactful missionary in the Bible, if not the history of the church. So this guy, Paul, he's kind of like what we would call a super-Christian, Right, he's the Christian of Christians. Like if there was an example of someone you're supposed to look to of how you should live, it's Paul. Paul lived a really, really, really obedient life to God. And yet, this is the same guy who in Romans 7 is talking about how he struggles with his sin. This is the same guy who's talking about having to fight this inner desire to do evil. Yeah. Because Paul understood what his human nature was. And so as we look at Romans 7, Paul's kind of going in this monologue where he says, look, I get it. I'm spiritual. The law is spiritual. And I'm a Christian. And so I live in the spirit if I live in Christ, but I, by nature, am unspiritual. And so I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what the good is. I know what the bad is. But so often I neglect the good and I only do the bad. And he says, and because of that, it's not just that I do some bad things. It's that I, by nature, am bad. And you may be sitting here thinking, Chris, I thought you said this was like a message of hope from Jesus, and so far it felt like you've just kind of been beating us across the head with a stick. And if you feel that way, it's not super inaccurate. But the reason for this is I need you to first understand that you also are not unique in your struggles with sin. That this is a universal issue and it's the reality for every single one of us. That if you live as a Christian, then you live in the tension between spirit and flesh. And so what this means for you is that your life is going to be a constant struggle between following God and sinning. It's a never ending battle that we, just, that we don't just outgrow. And look at what Paul says in verses 21 through 23. He says, so I find this law at work that although I want to do good, evil's right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. 
but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of law to the sin at work within me. So Paul's whole idea here is that if, if you're a Christian, if you're following Christ, you are constantly waging war against the very nature inside of you. Now the problem with that is, is that that point of tension, it's gonna cause problems. Because the reality is, is that we are human. We are weak. We mess up all the time as a result of this sin nature. And so we need to understand this because it highlights two truths about ourselves. The first one is, if, if you understand that you mess up, you understand you're not good. You understand that you need to know that having the capacity to do good in your life is not the same as being by nature good. That your capacity to do good is often going to be outweighed by your desire to do evil. And that leads to the second truth, is that you will mess up. That you need to understand that you are sinful by nature. This is a desire that lives inside of you all the way back from Adam and Eve, and it is constantly waging war against the spirit inside of you. And so if you understand that, then you need to understand it's not a matter of if you sin, just when you'll sin. But these two truths is also where a lot of this shame and regret starts to manifest in our lives the first time. Because it's really easy to take a look back at who you are and look at what you've done and feel like your situation is helpless and hopeless. But you need to remind yourself that even as we talk about our sinful nature, that your sin is no match for your savior. And look at what Paul writes as he finishes up chapter seven. He says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? But thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I find myself in my mind, I am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So he's gonna start off with verse 24, kind of the same way that a lot of us feel about ourselves at times, right? He says, look, I, I'm wretched. I'm a messed up person. I'm a sinner. And who could possibly save me? My situation, hopeless. But it's the next verse that changes everything for Paul. Then in verse 25, he says, thanks be to God who delivers me in Jesus Christ. And Paul he knew the answer to his condition, his sinful nature. It was Jesus. That no matter how bad Paul had messed up throughout his life, he knew that he could find forgiveness, love, and redemption in Jesus. And the same thing's true for us. We have the same exact access to that love and forgiveness that Paul did. But the problem is, is that we have a tendency to stop at verse 24. Yeah, I think human beings, we have this weird and obnoxious ability to just drag ourselves through the mud in response to our sin. And there is a healthy mourning that should take place with your sin. That is biblical. But the problem is, is that we take it a lot further than that, don't we? And so this is where our shame and our regret really starts to take hold of us sometimes, is that as we look back at who we are and we feel that we're not deserving of God's love, we don't wanna accept his forgiveness or his love. And so maybe you start to think questions like, you know, how, how could God love me if he knew about me, if he knew what I had done? How, if God knew about all my choices and all my mistakes, my past, would he ever choose to extend his grace to me? I am too messed up. I, it, it just cannot happen. And so as a result, you feel undeserving of God's love, undeserving of his forgiveness. And I got to be honest with you for a second. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. None of us deserve God's love. But that doesn't change the fact that he loves us with a deep, unconditional, everlasting love. The problem, though, is that in our shame and our regret, we want to end up trying to put conditions on an unconditional love. And so as a result of that shame, we start to come up with reasons as to why God couldn't possibly love us. Or we try to come up with reasons as to why the gospel couldn't possibly be as simple as it is. 
And a lot of times this ends up leading to two different types of negative responses in, to our sin. You know, on one hand, maybe you feel like it's just too much. You feel like, I've messed up too bad. I'm just too horrible of a person. My sin, it is, it is way too big for God. So I, I am unredeemable. And if I'm unredeemable, then why even try? Why should I even give this whole Christianity, this faith thing a shot? And so maybe as a result of that, you end up distancing yourself from a relationship with God as a result of that shame that you feel. And so you push away God. You push away the church. You push away godly influences in your life. You push away all the things of Christ almost as a way to sort of punish yourself because of your sin. And if you feel this way, I'm, I'm going to say something that might sting a little. If you feel that the sin in your life is somehow too powerful for the love of God to overcome, get over yourself. Not only are you magnifying the sin in your life to a level it doesn't deserve, but you are diminishing the love of God to think that you could ever change the way he feels about you. God's love, it is unconditional. It is everlasting. It is unchanging. God loves you. He knows your heart. He knows what you've done. And despite all of that, he still loves you. And the Bible's very clear on this. Look at Romans 5, 6 through 8. It says, you see, just at the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says this. It says, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions, that it's by grace that you've been saved. And John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world. He loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. See, there's one thing that the Bible is absolutely clear on. There's one thing that it, it talks about so much. It's that the love of God, it transcends everything we've done. That it can't be stopped. You can't change God's mind. You need to understand that you do not have the ability to out your welcome with God. His love is the greatest love we've ever known, displayed on the cross, ever present throughout the entire Bible. You can't change his mind. Because despite everything that you have ever done to rebel against God, he still loves you. You can't change that. And Jesus put an end to this argument when he uttered his final words on the cross. That as he sacrificed himself for the sins of the world, Jesus said three words. He said, it is finished. He put the period at the end of the sentence. He put the nail in the coffin on that argument. And he sealed the deal and he proved God's love once and for all. That there is no denying that God loves you. So you've got to let go of this idea that you're unlovable by God. Your sin, it's not special. It's not all-powerful. It's not the one qualifier that goes against God. It's just sin. And yes, sin has power. I don't want you to think that it doesn't. I don't want to diminish the reality of what sin is. It can have the ability to wreck your life. But its power stops there. It is no match for the love of God. God's love is an unstoppable force that you can never change. Nothing can get in the way of that. So if you find yourself distant with God, what's worth asking the question? Who's pushing who away? Because here's what I promise you. God's not distant. God's not running away from you. In fact, quite the opposite. God still loves you. God chases after you. God wants a relationship with you. And so my challenge to you today is that if you've ever felt this way, don't run from God, run to him. Because it's in him that we find that forgiveness and that love that's never gone away. He still loves you and he still forgives you. So find redemption in God. Now, maybe you don't struggle with feeling like you can't earn God's love or that it's unreachable. In fact, maybe you feel the exact opposite. You struggle 
with feeling like in light of everything that you've done, in light of your sin, that you somehow need to earn back God's love and God's forgiveness. And so maybe you feel like you need to balance the scale, so to speak. And so there's, there's this threshold, right, that if you can just hit that threshold, then you'll get God's love and you'll get God's forgiveness. But if you don't meet that threshold, well, then in comes the wrath and the anger of God. Now, I had a professor in college who referred to this idea as what he called zapology theology. It's very scientific. But it's this idea that if you messed up, God would zap you. He'd strike you down, right? And so it's that concept of if we do good, well, God will bless it. God will take care of you. But if you sin, then you messed up, right? So God punishes you. So he lets your life just fall into shambles, and then he's going to kind of beat you back into submission. Well, I need to make it very clear right now. So I just want to get, I want to set the record straight for you. That if you feel that way, I want you to know God's not out to get you. He's not sitting around waiting for some gotcha moment in your life. And he's certainly not sitting around waiting for you to claw and scratch your way back to him. See, think about it. If God's goal was to punish the sin in the world ultimately and to make you earn his forgiveness, what was the point in the gospel? I mean, why send your son to die if you were just going to make them earn it anyway? But that's not what happens. Look at what John 3.17 says. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That the plan for the gospel, it's always been redemption. It's always been that we didn't have to earn it and that God was not interested in punishing us. God wanted to save us. But when you talk about redemption, when you talk about salvation, by its very nature, redemption implies the understanding that you cannot earn it. And Paul understood this concept very well. It's why when you look at a verse like 724, that Paul talks about this idea of rescue, being rescued by God. It's because he understood that no matter how much good he did in his life, and think about it, he's Paul, right? He's done a lot of good. He knew that he could never meet the standard of righteousness that God set for us. So if Paul's not meeting it, why do we think we can But Paul also understood that salvation wasn't his to earn. That he knew that he would have to accept it as a free gift through God, through faith in Jesus. Trusting that Jesus was enough to overcome the sin in his life. So what about you? Do you trust that Jesus is enough? Do you trust that he covers your sins? Or do you still struggle with feeling like you have to earn God's love and forgiveness? Listen, a transactional relationship with God, it's never going to end well. First, I need you to know that if a relationship is transactional, where all it is is about what you give and what you get, it's not real. But second, the problem with the transactional relationship with God, you can't earn it. You cannot do it. I don't care how hard you try. You can show up to church every single Sunday. You can work to remove every single sin in your life. You can serve all the time. You can pray like never before. You can read your Bible every single day. You can read it cover to cover. You can give away all the money in your bank account in the name of Jesus. But if you're counting on those things to provide you with right standing with God, won't happen. We don't measure up. So the problem is, is that when you try to earn it, you're going to end up putting yourself in a worse situation than you were before. Because by the end of it, after all this work, after all that you've done, you're just going to feel like you aren't good enough. And the reality is, you're not good enough. That no matter how hard you try, There's no amount of good deeds that you can do that will cover the ground that your sin stretches. But that's why we have to remind ourselves of what Paul says in verse 25. Thanks be to God who delivers us through Christ Jesus. That we can't earn it. We're not good enough. But Jesus is.
Jesus paid the price for us. He lived the perfect life. He died the perfect death, paid the perfect sacrifice, and rose from the grave three days later so that we could have the gospel, so that we could accept that. And so for us, the answer to our sin, it's not trying to outgood the evil in our life. It's Jesus because he's enough. It's accepting the gospel in faith that, yes, we mess up. We do not meet the standards of God. But forgiveness is freely given in Jesus despite all of that. So don't let your sin and your shame and the regret tell you that you've got to earn God's love. You've got to earn God's forgiveness. You don't have to. That forgiveness, it was given to you freely in Jesus. So accept it. So how do we respond today? We've been talking about some ways that we shouldn't respond to our sin. But what do we do? What do we do when we mess up? Well, look at verses eight, uh, 1 through 2 from Romans 8 for me. It says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. So Paul's kind of writing, a, a tying up a little, nice little bow on everything he's talked about up to this point. And he says, look, here's the deal. You will sin. You will mess up. You are going to fail to meet the standards of God. But your failures, not the end of your story. They're not your identity. See, you're a sinner. Yeah. But you're a sinner saved by grace. And so when Jesus looks at you, when God looks upon you, he doesn't see your failures. He sees Jesus. So how do we respond to our failures? What do we do? build your foundation on Jesus because he's enough. But Jesus, he didn't die to condemn you. He died to save you. And that means that you don't have to run from God anymore. It means that you don't have to try and earn your way to salvation, to forgiveness. It means that you're not stuck in this sin. So you've got to stop focusing on this regret and the shame in your life. And you've got to look to the author of redemption, to the source of forgiveness. It's Jesus. Because he's enough. And if you accept that in faith, find freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from your shame and your regret. A freedom to start new, to start over, to move on. To have an active, growing relationship with God. So that's my challenge for you today. Build your foundation on Jesus. And this will look different for each of you. You know, maybe for some of you, this looks like returning to a relationship with God for the first time in a long time. Because you need to remind yourself today that God loves you. He never left you. And he still wants a relationship with you. Maybe you're here and, and you've never accepted that forgiveness. You've never accepted the freedom and grace that we find in the gospel, that we find through Jesus. And you want to know what it looks like to follow that Jesus. Or maybe you're here and you've spent a lot of your life trying to earn your way to God. And maybe for the first time today, you need to accept the forgiveness. Ask God for his grace instead of trying to earn it. But whatever that looks like for you, don't let your shame and your regret keep a hold on you. Look to the source of redemption Look to your author and perfecter of faith. Look to Jesus because he's enough. Build your foundation on him because in him we find freedom and forgiveness. There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. In just a second, we're going to close. I'm going to lead us in a moment of communion and then we'll respond to God in worship. Uh, But as we close, I want to give you a quote. There's a man by the name of D.L. Moody, and if you're not familiar with him, he was an author and evangelist in the 1800s, and he spent most of his adult life teaching people about the forgiveness of God, that he took this message to a broken world. So he understood what it looked like to be forgiven by God pretty good. And he has this quote about forgiveness, and I love this. This is what he said. He said, the voice of sin is loud, but the voice of forgiveness is louder.
And I don't think there's a better reminder for us to end on today. But yeah, you're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. But your sin is no match for your Savior. That your failures are not the end of your story. So don't let them be. You have an opportunity today to respond in the freedom that Jesus has given. But it's up to you to respond. So which voice will you listen to today? Will you allow your sin and your shame to hold you down and keep telling you the lie that your situation's hopeless? Or will you live in the freedom and forgiveness that Jesus died to give you? Let's pray.